he's out of the game. Say hello in the chat. Tell us where you're coming in from. Oh man, we're flying. We got big numbers today. It must be Bill Crystal's presence draw, <laughs> drawing in the draw. No, Look it's best selling author Tim Miller. You know, the uh, book's yeah. out. It's the buzz is intensifying. <laughs> you know, it's 12 it's days. We got 12 days until it gets into people's audible feed or their Amazon package. They can go down to their local indie book stop. Hey, St. Louis. Da, 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 da. Mona, how are you feeling? I feel good. I'm getting my sense of taste and smell back. Oh, really? That's so nice. How long was that gone? It really wasn't that bad. It was more in eh, five, six days. Not too bad. It's weird though, right? I'm told. Oh, it's so weird because I would- You're drinking up- something you know is like coffee and it doesn't taste like exactly. anything. Exactly. It might as well have been turpentine. It didn't matter. I mean, I was absolutely dead to any taste or smell for a while. It was so weird. Uh, and not fun. I mean, I don't want to say I live to eat, but you know, I like my food. <laughs> um, well, we'll be ending right on time today so that I can catch the tip of game six of the NBA finals as we have a lot of important things happening, but you know, we still need some sport in our life. So uh, Ben, are we, are we good on YouTube here? When you let me know when we're ready to go. We're trying the, the big, we are firing all cylinders. You can go whenever you're firing. All right. Hello and welcome to Thursday Night Bulwark. I'm your host, Tim Miller, tonight with an all-star panel, Bill Crystal, Will Salatin, Mona Sharon. Uh, we are your pregame for NBA Finals Game 6. Uh, and, man, we have a ton to cover uh, today. So if you uh, have Q&A, uh, remember to put them into the Q&A form, not into the chat. For those of you who are, who are in the chat, I will try to get to them, but uh, we have so much to cover. Who knows if we'll be able to make it, but I'm going to do my best. And if you are watching on YouTube, because of the big news today, the January 6th hearings, um, we are making this a one-time only free Thursday night bulwark. Um, if you want to join the chat, make friends, uh, throw verbal tomatoes at me, uh, complain about the commentary that you're seeing, you can do that just by joining Bulwark Plus. Go to plus.bulwark.com, sign up. You can do this every Thursday. We'd love to have you. Okay. Um, I, there's there's a lot of important stuff for today, but I just want to start really quick with a little theater criticism because I know that we have we had two dissenting views. Um, one I noticed on Slack today, and one on Twitter. Um, so, Will, I want to start with you. Um, you sent a tweet that basically uh, I think debunked some of the concern that maybe Judge Ludig was not ready for prime time today with his performance. Um, but uh, you had a contrary view on that. So what was your take on today's testimony, what we learned and, and how the committee did? Well, first of all, Judge Ludig, I thought was fine. I mean, he didn't speak rapidly, which is a lot of people object to because we live in such an age of such short attention spans. I don't know about his medical situation. I've seen lots of reporting, speculation, et cetera, stroke, what have you. I, I, I don't choose to comment on that. I don't know about it. All I wanted to say is that what Judge Ludig had to say was actually, if you read the words, quite concise to the point, important. He didn't waste a lot of verbiage. Uh, he, he made the, the large point of, that this was an attack on American democracy and that another one is coming. And I believe that what he said will is important for the next couple of years to prevent this from happening again. And will be very, it will be important for centuries, what he said. Um, and, uh, and what I, what I would say about this hearing in general, the one today is that I'm kind of a sap and I liked the affirmative story of Mike Pence. So I'm with JBL and some others about, I don't agree with Mike Pence about much, but Mike Pence did the important thing when it mattered. Other people did too, Greg Jacob and others. And as a result of that, our, I believe that our republic will stand. And I'm not, I don't choose to quibble with Pence right now or to complain about the four years of toadying that he did. <laughs> what, what he did at this moment really mattered. I want to get back to Pence. But before that, um, uh, Bill, you had Ludig on uh, Crystal Conversations. It was very good, I thought, about a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was listening to it during school drop off, I recall, and, and being kind of impressed with the depth of knowledge. What was your kind of take on him today and just your big takeaways having got to spend an hour with him, you know, recently. I mean, he's a, he's a very conservative judge who is cautious in it. He's not one of those who's alarmist, I guess you could say. And, 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 you know, was, uh, would be given, it was always pretty pro-executive 
branch and, and sort of strong, you know, presidency kind of judge as well. So the fact that he is, was so alarmed, and with, with the fact that it was so clear to him on January 5th and 6th, what the right course of action is, was, is very important. I mean, he's a judge. He's used to saying these are close calls. They're reasonable, you know, issues. People can differ. Eastman was his own law clerk. Um, so he wasn't, you know, he wasn't hostile to Eastman at all. And uh, he just said, ridiculous, out of the question, can't be entertained seriously. And then obviously his judgment, as Will says, going forward that we are in the crisis, we're not over the crisis, I think has to be taken very seriously. I thought, you know, one just general comment, it's hard, the hearings began a week ago, right now, right? Eight o'clock last Thursday night, it, seems, it doesn't seem like longer, right? And everyone said, and I, I guess I half believe this, not going to make much difference. You're preaching to the choir, who's going to change his, his or her mind, you know, blah, blah, blah. I feel like they've made quite a lot of difference in one very concrete way. If you had asked me, you know, one week and 10 minutes ago, uh, is the Justice Department going to indict Donald Trump? Is he a, is it actually going to be a criminal uh, a case against him? I would have said, no. I mean, uh, Garland clearly doesn't want to do it. There are reasons you might, some prudence, prudential reasons around what it's the whole criminal thing's probably not on the books anyway, except for some of the lower level people, maybe some of the financial stuff, you know, at the state level. I don't know. I really feel like the committee in three hearings has made a very compelling case for a criminal conspiracy, knowingly getting together to do something illegal of, with the, at the direction of the president with other people like Eastman took the fifth a hundred times. I mean, and he was acting at the express direction of, the, of Trump. I mean, how exactly do you not have criminal exposure there? So I think, I feel like whether they literally indict Trump, another question, but the notion that this was a genuine criminal conspiracy, not recklessness, irresponsibility, dereliction of duty, those are all very important, but an actual cons knowingly, conspiring knowingly not, to, to steal the election over to, against, explicit, you know, explicitly against various laws, I feel like they've they've changed that dynamic in a way in the narrative, whether it ultimately makes a difference, whether Trump voters, are, you know, uh, is another question. But don't you think it, it's it's made more of a dent? It's made more of a difference than I think people expected. Um, I do agree with that. Um, I want to get back to DOJ and Pence, who are both on my list uh, uh, for things to discuss more in depth. But Mona, I just want to come to you first on just general presence today. I don't want to reveal secret Slack convos, but it seems like maybe you were a little less impressed with the theater of, of today. But what, what's your uh, what are your big takeaways? So regarding um, Judge Ludig's performance today at the hearing, look, these hearings, when they're live, uh, when you're presenting yourself before the country at a live hearing, it does matter how you come across. It mattered that um, Mueller, for example, was ineffective when he testified before Congress. Those things count. But, but Judge Ludig also released a statement that is now available for everyone to read that was the kind of thing that made me want to wrap my arms around him and give him a kiss on both cheeks because it was coming from a man who has been one of the icons of judicial conservatism in America. I mean, Ted Cruz said he was his hero, his mentor, et cetera. The praise for him from all quarters on the right has been unstinting and deserved by the way. And and so when he said, this is an attack on our democracy, this is as serious as it gets, and we are, we're not out of the woods, and he has been an important voice talking about the need to reform the Electoral Count Act so that they cannot try to do this again, or at least it'll be much more difficult. I mean, that was so critical, so necessary, and so rare. I mean, there have just been so few conservative voices out there saying those things. So, however, I was not impressed with his, with his uh, performance before the committee, his statement will, will live forever. Um, okay, Bill, I want to come back to you on two other things, two brief things on Ludig really quick. JVL's in the chat requesting that I swerve against him because I do have a little bit of an anti-Ludig stance from, uh, he was kind of responsible for the lack of a conviction in the Senate, um, which in some ways gives him more credibility, but he gave McConnell basically the cover to not vote to convict, right? Because in addition to saying Eastman was wrong, another one of the things that he said when he's talking to those folks was that like, you can't really impeach a president that's already out of office, right? Like that was Ludig who gave him McConnell. So anyway, do you, do you have any pushback? That is my anti Ludig swerve. Do you have any pushback on that? And, and two, just when you talk to him, I do think this is so important that he is like deep in the Ted Cruz 
Alito kind of wing of the party. Like he is not, this is not a rhino cuck like me, right? Like this is, he's right in that crowd. Did you get a sense for what he's heard from, from those types when you guys were talking? Like what kind of pushback he's gotten? I didn't, we didn't really, you know, I'm not that close to him. So we didn't really talk about yeah. that. I would say, the, I think you're, look, for people like me and you, I think, you know, there, a lot of people should have said an awful lot publicly at different stages, whether it's in the middle of the Trump administration or in, in December and before January 6th or after January 6th when impeachment and then conviction were at issue uh, and even after that. And so Ludig chose to act as a retired, as he thinks, I think a, retire, a judge, a retired judge should act and be discreet and not weigh in and so forth, except he happened to believe that you shouldn't uh, convict a, uh, a former president, I guess. Uh, based on his reading of the law and the precedents or, or whatever, the constitution. Um, so yeah, so I know I don't have a real sense of, but, but I, I sort of agree that it's important that it's not just that he's so cons conservative and the Cruz likes him, it's also kind of his, he is, his, as that example shows, he's not someone who just sort of says, okay, now I'm in, I'm all in, 100%, right. I'm gonna speak out. He's been quite reticent in, in speaking out. And I, and I genuinely do believe this. He only is doing it because he thinks uh, as the, the, we are in danger. He's not doing it because I want to set the record straight. I want to explain a little more about what Pence was thinking. In fact, he's been rather uncommunicative about that. I would say, you know, he wasn't close. He didn't talk to Pence. Right? He talked to Greg Jacob. And that's kind of a, you know, for all the hoopla, uh, he was very important, I think, in reassuring Pence that he was doing the right thing. So yeah, I think he's a genuine judge. He thinks of himself very much as a judge, which makes the, the severity or the clarity of his statements about where we are now particularly striking. Um, I'm going to go to Will and vote on this. I saw there, uh, something very strange happen to me today on Twitter.com. I saw a uh, pushback against the committee from someone on the right that I thought, that's not completely crazy. Uh, you know, I, most of the complaints of this committee from Fox and from uh, our friends on the on the right, they've either been strategically silent or they've been so preposterous or ridiculous or ad hominem or excuse making. Uh, but the one I saw today was about the question of the Supreme Court. Greg Jacobs said, you know, whatever, it would have been a 7-2, maybe a 9-0. Eastman self-assessment was 7-2 or 9-0. Uh, and this person um, had tweeted that was like, well, for all of the never Trumpers, I, this isn't a direct quote, but the, the gist of it was for all the never Trumpers bedwetting about the end of democracy, like, if the Supreme Court would have just ruled against these guys in 36 hours, like, were we really at the brink here democratically or might you know, might it, again, have been just a not good thing that the institutions were going to resolve as they had in many other occasions during the Trump presidency. So where, Mona's already shaking her head. So I'll start with you. How, what's your pushback to that assessment? Uh, so um, how many times can you have a mob, um, you know, come in and commit violence against an institution before the institution collapses? You know, I mean, if, if, the, uh, if the Supreme Court, if, if Pence had done Trump's bidding, and then the Supreme Court had said, sorry, that wasn't right. The mob would have gone to the Supreme Court. I mean, at that point, they would have seen this works. We can do this. And really, I mean, uh, Bill is fond of talking about hinge moments in history. I, I so agree with that and, and that things are contingent. And, you know, we narrowly, narrowly escaped a true constitutional crisis and if you push things so far and you show that that mob action can can unseat democracy, there's no coming back. So yeah, go ahead and try your luck. See if see if see if people will respect the ruling of the Supreme Court once they've seen that a mob. You know, suppose there had suppose they had gotten Pence and killed him. You know, th then what? Sure. Sure. Well, uh, that's uh, obviously there are a lot of terrible things that could have happened. But Will, you're a level-headed guy. What's your sense of like? Okay, sure. A lot of terrible things could happen. There could have been an assassination. You know, some of the states might have tried to give alternate electors. But like at the end of the day, on January 20th, what happened was going to happen regardless. What's, what's your pushback to that? Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of, of letting, you know, if the Russians are marching on Kiev, I'd rather stop them in the countryside. If I can't stop them in the countryside, <laughs> I'll stop them in the suburbs. I don't want them at the gates of Kiev. So I'm happy to intervene at least at the point of January 6th and Mike Pence, which should have been you know, resolved much earlier at the Al Gore point of these, at the uh, Electoral College meeting. But I would rather stop it there. I don't wanna go into the court. I don't know how long the court would have to deal with it. We're up against the deadline of January 20th. We have all kinds of crisis coming at us. I do wanna say one other thing about this. Please. The, 
The Eastman argument was, according to Greg Jacob, Eastman's argument was that the court wouldn't take it, right? That the courts would bow out. And I don't understand the legal technicalities of what they're calling the what political question doctrine, you know, like the courts aren't going to get involved because it's a political question. So Eastman's whole game plan was the courts would stay out, that institutions in general would stay out. It was basically to clear out all the checks and balances that there would be on the executive claiming that he had won the election and that he could stay in power. And as Jacob said, that whole line of argument, including that the courts should stay out of it, which is what Eastman wanted, is completely antithetical to the essence of America. I mean, one, to me, one of the most important things that came out of this hearing was a very straightforward definition of authoritarianism. And it is the Mike Pence definition that one person gets to choose the president. That is literally dictatorship. And that is literally what Eastman and Trump wanted. Can I just have one word? I Please. think that's very well said. I mean, if you want to take that Supreme Court, well, no problem, they would have resolved it. Would Trump have accepted that decision? That's Why right. was Bush v. Gore was a decision they had to down by the Supreme Court. The, the second half of that, the second, you know, the flip side of it was Al Gore accepted it. That was kind of important, right? If Gore hadn't, if Gore had behaved like Trump, you know, who knows, right? Now, ultimately, 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 does the court maybe prevail because it has enough, you know, stature and so forth? Maybe. But the degree to which it, the idea that, well, what if the Supreme Court had ruled seven two, that if it's all over, really? I don't think Trump would have accepted that. And this goes to the J.D. Vance definition of authoritarianism, with which is, you know, what's the Supreme Court going to do? You know, send their army at Trump? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, do think like in this case... As the Pope, yeah. Yeah, right. In this case, like Trump's, you know, um, you know being a bad criminal does not excuse you of criminal liability, right? So like at this point, like Trump's like inability to get people who would do his bidding at the Department of Defense and other, like there were a lot of stop points that probably would have stopped this, even if Pence had done the wrong thing. So I think that, I guess counterfactual has some merit but but you I, I agree with all of you on 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 the fact that it does not excuse anything um i, I want to i want to get back to pence but i want to go to the doj first because we, we've all been dancing around it I, I had a tweet that was asking us um if we would address uh they wanted actually mona and bill's opinion exactly on uh the doj put out an interesting press release today saying that the January 6th committee is kind of hurting their investigation by not publicizing all of the um, depositions. Um, and so uh, I guess Bill and Mona first, I I'm interested in your in your take on why they did that. And, and also secondarily, is that a sign that maybe they're more proactive than we think? I, I don't know, it seems it, it seemed like there was maybe just a little glimmer of hope that they were, the fact that they would even, even make that criticism Makes you, makes you think that they're looking at this more seriously. So I think the uh, Justice Department should indict and prosecute Trump. Um, I know that's not universally agreed to, but I, I firmly believe that there has to be accountability and um, whatever, you know, and there will be severe political consequences, but the political consequences we're already dealing with. I mean, the country's already riven, but, um, Regarding, I, 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 I haven't had a chance to look at the Justice Department statement because I was doing Beg to Differ this afternoon, but I would just say the Justice Department has a, you know, the best lawyers at its disposal. It has the FBI to do its investigations. It has the power to issue subpoenas. Um, the notion that the committee is somehow inhibiting its ability to do uh, investigations on this matter strikes me as a little bit odd. What do you think, Bill? On the other hand, why, why isn't the committee emailing over the depositions to the Justice Department with certain stipulations <laughs> that they can't share them too much? Unless there's some legal reason that once DOJ has it in its possession, it gets discovered or something, it gets into discovery and they would lose their confidentiality. Presumably they'll send them over when the hearings are finished. I don't, I don't understand I'm why- I'm a little mystified by what this fight, right? what this fight mean, is about, yeah. But I wasn't one, just one footnote to what you were saying. I. I it's so important that I, I think whether Trump is indicted or not. I mean, I got to Washington 10 years after Watergate about, uh, you know, the Attorney General of the United States had gone to jail. The White House Chief of Staff had gone to jail. The White House Counsel, John Dean, had been had gone to jail. It was it was a real thing. And I'm not saying it, it changed my behavior. I hope it didn't. You know, I hope I would have behaved anyway decently as in the, in the cabinet department I was in and, and then at the White House. Uh, 
in, in the George H. W. Bush administration. But it was it was important that that happened. People have sort of Watergate for people is is, is too much of it is kind of Woodward and Bernstein and Nixon resigning, which obviously is the most important thing and all that. But it's really important that people at senior levels of the government feel, you know what, if I break the law, I'm personally going to pay a price. Not just I'm going to be shamed or I might be disbarred, but I'll still get paid a million bucks for being a MAGA oh. lawyer and all this, you know, or MAGA celebrity or something. People need to, it's almost more important than the president himself that his senior aides feel that they have legal liability if they flat out knowingly break the law. And, and in that respect, Meadow, uh, that's true, I think, for some people outside government, or not just people in government, and people like uh, like Eastman, but Meadows. I mean, the idea that no one's been indicted yet, it, in, uh, after a criminal conspiracy to overturn an election run from the White House with a lot of government officials involved, that, that feels a little wrong to me, actually. It feels like that is not doing enough to get to Will's formulation, to put up another barrier to future authoritarianism. And it was far, far worse than anything that was done in Watergate. Okay. I mean, this was an attempt to subvert the Constitution and to end our democracy. Far, far more serious than the crimes that people went to jail for uh, in Watergate. Well, I made that case also in the board today. You look, you look skeptical of that. You don't, you don't think so? I mean, I, it was kind of like a half-baked little mini robbery at Watergate that Nixon didn't even know about until the back end. And this one is like the president trying to end our democracy. You don't think it's far, far worse? I, I think this one is different in many respects, but the one that stands out to me is, and this sort of goes to what I think these hearings are about. I, I, I think these hearings are very basic. You know, look, it's great. I'm with you guys. I hope Trump gets indicted. I hope other people get indicted. I hope people pay a penalty that may, you know, but I think what the committee is trying to do is establish a basic understanding of what happened here. I mean, in Watergate, it was a, qu a question of sort of corruption behind the scenes, but there wasn't sort of a public uh, misunderstanding or public deception of the public about the very basic things like the election. What we have here is, you know, we, we have the symptoms of this in the form of that, you know, 75% of the Republican party thinks Joe Biden was not legitimately elected. We have so many people believing the election was stolen. I think the committee is doing a great job of establishing a basic narrative here um, that, you know, one of the hearings just making clear that the election was not stolen and that Republicans knew it. Uh, one, this one sort of showing that the vice president did not have the authority to do what Trump was trying to get him to do. Um, another one that was, you know, the first hearing that basically showed that Trump directly inspired, you know, extremists, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers. And so th these are basic, they're just trying to convey a basic truth about what happened here. To me, that's fundamentally different from Watergate. And it's a job that it's the most important job that we have right now to reestablish a national consensus about what really happened and why it's bad and dangerous. Can, so I, can I just respond to that real quick? So I think Will's absolutely right. It's much more important. I mean, there, there's that role of the committee in establishing what happened and establishing the true narrative and bringing over whatever percentage of Americans still have open minds and can be persuaded that what happened here was a, was a catastrophe. That's the most important job they have, far more important than leading to any sort of criminal prosecutions. On the other hand, that quotation from uh, Hirschman, where he says to um, Eastman, you know, what you had in mind is effing crazy. And, you know, I'm going to give you some free legal advice. Get yourself a criminal lawyer. You're going to need one. That should be true, right? That should be true. Yes. Um, I'm not, I have two important pieces of feedback. Uh, JVL's in the chat saying I look like a teen idol tonight. So thanks, JVL. And sorry for people who watch this on a podcast. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not a lawyer. I, I have a text here that's replying to this. Part I'm of the modest, reason, Tim. Uh, yeah, part, 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 of the, part of the reason why, uh, why Bill, um, to answer Bill's question about why uh, congressional uh, the, the committee might not have given everything over to DOJ is, is just nature of people's like privacy rights, right? Like the DOJ would have to have had a warrant to get some of the materials that a, that a congressional committee could just subpoena. So, uh, you know, there I think might be some legal wrangling, you know, in, in what exactly, you know, is within the DOJ's jurisdiction to get without, without going to a warrant. So there might be some technical, uh, technical reads for that, which makes sense. Um, I, I want to get to uh, in front of us so people know it's coming. We've got Pence, Ginny, and if Biden's too old to run. Um, so all three of those are still coming. But a quick uh, thing for those who are YouTube watching us on the live stream, this is free tonight. If you want to 
uh, be a board plus member, chat, complain about my opinions, uh, uh, compliment my how I look, uh, join board plus, and you can come and be in the chat. It's reality. It's already happening over here. Ben Shapiro is apparently in the chat. Someone pretending to be Ben Shapiro, at least. So, you know, lots happening. Not um, only that, you can do other things besides compliment him on his appearance. You can criticize him when he gets on these live streams and his hair is all in weird <laughs> directions. You know, you can comment on that too. I take all <laughs> kinds of feedback and I take it very serious. I take it very seriously. Um, uh, Okay, Pence, I just wrote something a couple of hours ago. So my biggest complaint about today's hearing is that Mike Pence wasn't there. I don't, Greg Jacobs seems like a nice guy, um, uh, an honorable person doing his duty uh, uh, to the government and, and actually in the spirit of public service, happy that he was there today. Uh, Mark Short, I guess, volunteered to testify you know, but we have like this video of him it looks like a security camera, like in this deposition, which in some ways I think gives it a sense of gravitas, but in other sense it's kind of weird. Why isn't Mark Short there? And, and why is why do we have to hear about all these conversations all day that Mike Pence was having and Mike Pence doesn't tell us? And so I think that part of the reason is that Mike Pence, obviously for, for political reasons, doesn't think it benefit, benefits him to participate any more than he has. But another part of the reason is I, I almost think that everybody's already like kind of assumed the conclusion that he isn't going to. And so he's not getting any pressure to do so, I, you know, and so I, I felt it felt important to me to write today because I think there should be some pressure for Mike Pence to talk about what happened, what he was doing that day. I, I, if the president really, as, as Liz Cheney laid out, had abdicated his responsibility to protect the Capitol. And, and Mike Pence had to do it. And Mike Pence was the vice president giving orders to the you know joint chairman of the joint chiefs i that feels like something he needs to testify to publicly so um you know where do you kind of obviously i think we all agree that he should testify but, but what's your you know sense of the political side of this um uh bill maybe we'll start with you and then um you know is do you think there's any potential to sort of shame him into this at this point or, or what do you think the thinking of the one six committee is on this I mean, I, th I think your piece is very good. I think he's pretty far down the road of positioning himself where he is. He, I was a proud, proud to be part of the Trump administration. A lot of we accomplished a huge amount of things. It was this minor problem when he tried to overturn democracy. And I kind of went along with that quietly, frankly, for two months, you know, but then I really was, I did the right thing, which he did at the last minute. And then I shot up about it again. And that's, that's my presidential, that's my platform. You know, I guess they think Let's that's build a him a monument on the mall. There's some room, you know, between <laughs> yeah, uh, no, Washington you're not going for monuments on the wall. I agree with that. Yeah. Whether that's uh, a political consideration or just what he truly believes, you know, is, is a little hard to say. Well, am I playing fantasy politics here? Is this just Tim, you know, uh, like being a pundit speaking out of his ass? Or is this like a legit? This is legitimate, right? This is a legitimate criticism of him. You at the beginning were talking about how much you you admired Mike Pence. Like, where is he? Doesn't he need to finish the job? You know, I, it would be great if he did. I, I'm not I'm not insisting on it. You know, I'm, again, I'm Why? sort of, I, it, it, Mike Pence is, was extremely useful today. He didn't need to be there to serve the function that he is serving. And that is to be a Trumper who got off at the last exit ramp from the highway to crazy, right? Who got off that I'm not going to overturn. Look, a lot of the Trump legal strategy, by which the, the strategy to get Donald Trump back in the presidency and re-endanger our republic is to set up a polarity, to polarize between Democrats, look, if you don't like the way the, the economy is going, if you don't like the way Biden's running things, you've got to be with us, right? And, and what's, what's really going on is there's Democrats and then there's a set of people to the right of the Democrats, a huge audience, right? Within that audience, there's like people who are like with Trump. They're telling you have to be with Trump or you're not really one of us. If you're, if you're not with Trump, we kick you out, Liz Cheney. We kick you out, Adam Kinzinger, right? Um, and then within the Trumpers, that you, there's this subset of people who are with him all the way to either justifying January 6th or dismissing the hearings as not really important. What happened there, it's all the sideshow. We should just be talking about inflation. And that's like the House Republican leadership, Kevin McCarthy, Elise Stefanik, et cetera, right? So the whole Trump strategy is to polarize it between being a Biden supporter and being with Trump all the way. What Mike Pence does is he's not just a Republican, right? He's not just a Trumper. He was with Trump the whole way. He He's... He was like Trump's right-hand man. He was there the whole way. He is a Trump Republican right up until the coup. And at the end, he says, no, I'm not with that. So he, he provides a model for people who are conservative, 
who are sympathetic to Donald Trump's policies, who frankly like Donald Trump's presidency. They like the tax cuts. They like the judges. They like the military buildup, all of that. And he says, you can be for all of that, but be against the coup and be for investigating the coup. And that's great. Is he for investigating the coup? He's the model that they use. Has he, so what I'm has saying he said is, anything that he's he, about how good it is? Or I guess what I'm saying, right. Tim, is there's a difference between real Mike Pence and Mike Pence, the legend. And I'm <laughs> yes. really happy to have Mike Pence, the legend. Okay. Mike Pence, the man, the myth, the legend. I like the drain the reflecting pool and name it after Mike Pence. Strat- <laughs> a suggestion from Josh in the chat. Mona, I want to take one more swing at you on this one. Mike Pence, there were some pictures that were shown today. He's with his wife and his brother in some room in the Capitol. Yeah, that's the Why? vice president's, that's the president Thank of the you. Senate's room. It's the room the vice president gets. I've been in that room so many times. Yeah. It's right off the Senate. It's He gets it as president of the Senate. And it's where the White House staff hangs out when they're up on the on the Hill working, you know, in the, in the Senate. It's right there in the Capitol. I, I was so shocked. I mean, I just I hadn't been in that room in 25, 30 years, I guess. But I was like so shocking. It sort of looks the same. On the other hand, down there in the in the uh, garage where he was, you know, taken that I don't think I'd ever been down there. So so Mike Pence in Bill's luckily. favorite capital room. OK, yeah, luckily, Mona. All right. So he's in there. His wife is having to close the shades yeah. because they're afraid that the the so his own supporters are going to see him and try to kill him. He's yeah. on a FaceTime with his kid. Like there are these pictures. He's on a FaceTime with his kid, scared for his life. Then he gets down to the garage. And he's so concerned for himself that he's worried that the Secret Service, there's an inside job that's out to get him. So he doesn't get in this car because he's a little worried about, about the, he doesn't know who the driver of the car is. At least that's what, we don't know if that's true. That's what Greg Jacob, his lawyer, testified. So we don't know. We had to hear from his spokesman. But that, that's one of the potential reasons that he didn't get in that car. He's oh, scared no. for his life. No. Uh, all it, of this, all you know, all of this, uh, you know, this harrowing four hours, it only happened because do, because his boss left him for dead, basically, didn't do anything. And now he's like at an oil and gas roundtable today with 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 the governor of Ohio, like talking about how Trump got some things right when it comes to gas policy. Like, what the fuck? That guy, he almost killed him. Like, he almost got him killed. Why, why wasn't he testifying today? Picky, picky, picky. No. <laughs> guy Am I crazy? What is happening? And you're going to hold a grudge. I mean, come on. <laughs> Look, um, <clears throat> you know, this is, this was, uh, I said this actually today on uh, our podcast, you know, um, some of the people, are, the anti-antis are saying, you know, about these hearings, oh, you know, there's nothing new here, you know, and I, my feeling is, oh, when a sitting president of the United States tweets out a message that is encouraging a mob to kill his vice president, that's kind of new. I uh, haven't seen that one before, right? Um, <clears throat> no, it's, I, I find Pence's position actually utterly mystifying, right? He's trying to preserve his political viability. He thinks he can be the Republican standard bearer on the grounds that he was a loyal Trump um, tribune willing to praise his broad shouldered leadership for four years, but drew the line at subverting the constitution in this particular instance. And by the way, I give him full credit for that. I think that was great. Um, But does he think that the Republicans that loved Trump are going to forgive him for saving the Republic? No, they're going to regard him as a traitor. There's absolutely no way that he can thread that needle. There's no constituency out there of Republicans who liked Trump's policies, but depart from him on the coup. It, it just doesn't, there's no- I don't quite agree with that, Mona. I, I mean, you I, I, I think Pence right. will, those people will go to DeSantis or to, you know, someone else probably not depends, but it's not, look, there's who knows what percentage of the party is just Trump all the way. I think Will's categorization was about right though. I mean, conceptually, there are these different chunks. Let's just say there's 10, 15% anti-Trump, maybe that's too high, Liz Cheney, 40, I don't know, 45% pro-Trump all the way. But there is 30, 40% who are sort of different slices of, he, I like him, I really like him, but you know, it's a little crazy that January 6th, maybe that's a little too much for 2024. Maybe it's too much of a monkey on the back, could hurt his chances to win. Maybe I'll, you know, I think those people, those people ultimately 
probably don't go to Pence, but I, I had lunch today was one of the few ex Republicans I'm still talking to. And he was like the donors he's talking to, he works with donors were, you know, Pence, I don't know, wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. I prefer DeSantis personally or Pompeo, or they have their whole list of, you know, you know, people they like who are, but I do think these, as a, we were making fun. I think you just tended to this uh, the Brit Hume, you know, thing about how you know, oh, you Republicans, how foolish you, how, you Democrats, you liberals, you're doing this thing and you're strengthening the Republicans because they'll nominate someone more electable than Trump. But I do think it's not ridiculous as a pure analytical matter that Trump is. I don't know what the numbers are. I'm just making these up. Obviously, but Trump has gone from 75 percent. You know, we're for him in the primaries to 65% and that there's yeah, some erosion and so, especially okay. in donor world, in Republican wealthy lawyer world and the people who look at Greg Jacob and think, you know, that's kind of me, right? I mean, okay. they, they, no, they're no, sort no, of no. open to, to deserting Trump more than they were a week ago. I think that's probably true. Uh, that is a separate- They point. may not go to Pence. I mean, no, that's no, not the question. We're here, do a quick, this, is, this is the key thing. Let me, let me make this distinction. Yeah. There are people who are ready to move on from Trump. But their reasons are they don't think he can win or they think, you know, that some, we need someone younger. Yeah. Right. It is yeah. not going to be a principled position that he nearly brought the republic to its knees and Trump say, and, and Pence saved us. That constituency doesn't exist. That was okay, my what. Point. All right. Really quick. What percent chance around the horn is Mike Pence? a Republican nominee ever in the future? What percent chance does he have sitting today to ever be a Republican, the Republican presidential nominee? Will? Uh, below 5%, probably below one. Below one. Bill? Yeah, I'd say 5%. 5%. Mona? 4%. Okay. Does anybody raise your hand if you think that it's more likely that Mike Pence is a major party nominee than Sarah Longwell at some point over the course of their life? Does anybody think Mike Pence is better positioned? Or what about Al Gore? If I told you I'm from the future and either Al Gore is the Democratic nominee or Mike Pence is a Republican, who do you think is more likely? I've got Sarah and Al above him. I think he's more likely than me, less likely than Sarah and Al. That's my take. Um, I guess it's just just to close the loop on this and then we can move on. Then why isn't he testifying? Then why isn't he testifying? Right. Like, that's the whole point. Like the political thing, I, I, I would get it if it was, you know, I, I get why Ron DeSantis is doing what he's doing. Right. But I, I just I just don't get it in this case. I think the ship has sailed and he just does have a chance for a big moment. But anyway. West Wing, Josh Lyman. Here I am. Okay. Um, I want to move on to before we close out on the insurrection and get to, you know, the Democrats. Um, I want to get to Ginny. Um, so John Eastman, Maggie Haberman uh, report last night uh, is that John Eastman in an email to Mr. Cheeseboro. <laughs> it's a great Cheeseboro. That's his name. That's a great name, whatever it is. Um, uh, said that he had insight that the Supreme Court was discussing whether or not they might take up something like this and that there was some controversy on the Supreme Court over what internally on the Supreme Court over whether or not to take these cases up. Now, it seems to me that there are only two possible explanations for that email from John Eastman. One is that he's just totally full of shit and is just sending emails out of his ass. And the other is that Ginny Thomas told him that she has reason to believe there's some controversy on the, on the Supreme Court about this. Um, uh, just the possibility, I and mean, I think that's probably 50 50, I would say. Everybody could give their own chances, but even if it's only half a possibility, like, doesn't Ginny Thomas have to testify? She expressed, I guess, to the Daily Caller today that she is open to it. Like, don't they have to go after Ginny Thomas on this? And, and Clarence Thomas? Doesn't Clarence Thomas have to testify under oath about this? Like, I know that you're not supposed to be held responsible for what your wife does, but if your wife tried to overthrow the government and you're a Supreme Court, don't, you know, I guess you could take the fifth, plead the fifth, but don't, don't we have to do something here? No? Will? I, I'm going to need to see a lot more uh, evidence developed on this that beyond the media reporting to, to, to know. I mean, there's so, Tim, there's so many threads of insanity going on. I, <laughs> I, I, look, I'm kind of scarred by the whole Mueller thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and my friends who d devoutly believed in the P tape and, you know, that I, I want to just pursue the best. There's so Don't lie. You had the people. candle. You had the P candle. You were lighting it every night. You had the P tape candle in your, in your kitchen. No. Yeah, I was a P-tape skeptic from the beginning, and my friends should have listened to me, and Democrats who went out talking about it should have listened to me. 
there's so much, the goods here on what happened are so clear that I, I don't want to be pursuing anything until that's really nailed down. And I, as I mean, I just think Ginny Thomas has a kind of star appeal that people, there are a lot of people who hate her and want her and she's nuts, but I, I wouldn't want to make her the focus of a hearing. I mean, Bill, okay, Mona agrees. Bill, come on, you got to come with me on this one. Uh, the, what, what was her, what were she and Clarence talking about at dinner? I don't know. Maybe they're in a, like a Lucy and Desi situation. They sleep in different beds. They don't have dinner together. They don't ever talk. But I assuming they talk, given the fact that Ginny Thomas was central to an effort to overthrow the government, I, I would think that she was going to mention that at some point well, to her she husband. Could have, but I mean, to be, I do think it's much more likely than 50 50 that uh, Eastman's just bullshitting on that. I don't think he had any insight. I'm not sure Ginny Thomas, I mean, declare, in some the court was, there was one vote where Thomas was against the other eight. There are lots of things were just dismissed without, as I recall, recorded votes. So it was presumably pretty, there were not dissents. I don't believe it was it was really ever in play at the Supreme Court. And so- and at the time they weren't even meeting in person, I believe they were, yeah. um, they were meeting remotely. So I don't know, the idea that there was like this big fight, who knows? So everybody's just, here, Tim. nobody, no. I, I'm getting excited about this. Everybody's like, no big deal. It doesn't bother you. Supreme wife of the Supreme court justice. Just, just, you know, no big, no well, I mean, we'll think, but again, Thomas could have known that his wife had these views about what state legislators could or couldn't do. He might've advised her one way or the other or not. But again, it's pretty hard to show that there's an actual, and there's that one dissenting vote. Where it's unclear what his rationale is about whether they should take a case. I don't think it's on the merits of the case exactly, is it? Um, maybe I'm wrong, I can't remember. But anyway, I think you well, need more. I'm just going to throw this out more. there. Look, well I don't want to be held responsible for everything that Tyler's doing down there, okay? Uh, but if he's trying to instigate a coup to overthrow the democracy, and you know, there's some leaked emails that come out about that. I would expect the Bullard Plus readers to be like, Tim, what's happening on the home front? Well, no, but I think <laughs> don't you at least have for the to committee answer for this? Like ask. it's not it's not like she was just kind of lobbying for big oil or something, you know. I don't I mean like it was a pretty central thing to his job. Um, but okay, that's just me. Uh, so the, the ahead, only the only relevance is um to that that this does make it, it seems to me. Um, incumbent upon Justice Thomas to recuse himself from anything regarding the election or, or decisions about it because of his wife's involvement. I do think that there's a very strong case for recusal. However, forcing him to testify, force, even forcing her to testify, I, I don't think is really necessary. I think it would be a sideshow and I think it would be perceived as a kind of um, you know, political witch hunt. I, I, it's not important enough uh, to distract the committee from its main task. All right. Maybe I'm drinking the MSNBC crazy juice on this one. Um, DD uh, asked in the chat, I just want to really quick circle back on the Pence thing, about whether we know that the January 6th committee has asked Pence. They haven't formally, to my knowledge, publicly, but I, I do, um, from talking to some reporter friends who I was asking about this, um, they're, they're behind the scenes there were requests to Pence um, that he testify and that there was some negotiation with Short. That's why Short testified. I think that Pence's th world, Pence's thinking, this is why I'm actually more critical of this. Pence's thing, I think, feels like he checked this box by having Short and Jacob testify. Um, and, and, and so it's not like those two guys are freelancing, right? Pence is saying like, these guys are kind of doing it on my behalf. Um, that to me doesn't make it worse per se, but kind of kind of it, it goes to show further that it's sort of like, well, why, why not just have blank pens? Okay, I want to move on to Joe Biden here um, for the last quarter, uh, 15 minutes, unless we have any great thoughts about the January 6th committee that I missed um, from the panel. Anybody in the questions, anything that we missed? Uh, the only yeah. thing, Tim, is that Definitely. story about uh, Pence and the Secret Service and the car. He, I, I believe his concern was that they were going to drive him out. They were going to evacuate him. And he didn't want that. Not that anybody was out to get him from within. I, I don't think I have to get him, like kill him. But but I, his, there were two stories that were put forth. I, and it seems like both from Jacob. And one was what you're saying, right? Like that he thought it was a bad picture, right? For the car to be leaving the Capitol. I think that's right. The other thing was that he said to the Secret Service person with him that he, whatever his name is, Tom or something, Tony, like, I trust you, but I don't know them. Like, that's kind of a weird thing to say, right? I don't know. Don't vice presidents just get in the car with the Secret Service when they try to get rid of them? You don't, you don't, you think I'm, I'm going a little Air Force One here? On yeah, you? I think you're Air Force One. And number two, it was Tim. It was a Tim. Tim, Tony, Tim, Tom. <laughs> I was close. Um, no, but, but it is relevant, actually, to your point, Tim, that um, Mark Short I, um, contacted the Secret Service 
and said that he was the worried about the vice president's safety because the president was about to turn on him. That's just, this is stuff out of a spy novel. Yeah. This is not supposed to be real life in the United States of America. And they also did, you know? and this could, again, this might be that I have the pen saying exactly right, but they also, there was that in Navy Yard, right? Like there had to be an internal investigation into uh, into members of the detail who were, who, were in, who were in Navy Yard about like, they, were, they had all the guns that they were gathering. Trump took, remember this, Trump took the head of a Secret Service detail, I think it was, not the head of the Smears, the head of the Secret Service, and made him like a deputy assistant, a deputy chief of staff in the White House or something, like midway through 2020. I mean, this was before the election. And I remember thinking at the time, whoa, this is supposed to be the most apolitical thing, totally got to keep everything confident. And there, Trump clearly had interest, and this is classic authoritarianism, if it was happening in another country, we would know exactly how to describe it, where you take the different elements of the security forces that are around you, and you see which ones you can politicize and make your own, make your own Praetorian Guard. Now, Trump was, it was buffoonish. It wasn't systematic. Thank God. There were huge institutional obstacles. Thank God. But I, I sort of <laughs> agreed that the whole secret, it's just another piece of evidence. And Pence knew that. And Pence probably knew that Trump was interested in, you know, just like with the, uh, you know, the, July, the, the thing across Lafayette Square and all this, he was interested in taking different parts of the government and making them as much his own personally as possible. Yeah. Uh, Will might be a pro-choice big government lib, but at least he isn't resistance brained like I am uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to the uh, the attempts to go after uh, Clarence Thomas and Mike Pence. OK, um, Mark Leibovich, my friend over at the writing of The Atlantic now, um, he wrote this the book, This Town, um, has a article today um, that essentially says that uh, he does not he thinks Biden should not run uh, and announced that he's not going to run. He thinks that would maybe give him a little bit of freedom to you know, do some more wheeling and dealing on uh, the economic issues uh, coming forth. Um, there's a notion that at 86 years old, at the end of his next term, he'd be closer to 90 than 80. And that like, we just need to, to speak, speak reality into existence, uh, I think was essentially the case that Leibovitz was making today. So um, I think that's, I think that his article is kind of tough to argue with. Um, I know JVL is on the opposite side of this, but he's in the chat, so we don't get to hear his opinion. Um, so does anybody want to offer the pushback against Leibovitz on this? Nope. No, we have, we have consensus. <laughs> well, it's just well, obvious. Look at that Pennsylvania poll that came out Wednesday, which had a lot of interesting things in it. But one thing it had was Shapiro winning the Democrat for governor by four points and Fetterman by nine. If you looked at that poll, went bother to go to the cross tabs. Biden is minus 16 in Pennsylvania, fave on fave. Biden is just fairly or unfairly, it's tough to govern, pandemic, Ukraine, you get a lot of stuff accumulates on your backs. So Biden is less popular than the Democratic Party. Biden's down 15 or so in job approval. The Democrats are down two and a half, three in the generic ballot. Maybe that'll change, but I'm not convinced it will. And I think therefore, if you care about the Democrats winning the, the 2024 election, you if you could arrange a clean transition, which is a huge if and which would require a long discussion, which we've had sometimes, I think, a little bit already. Uh, you're just better off being able to run a fresh candidate, honestly. And uh, I would argue a moderate Democrat, next generation, there are a million, maybe a governor or whatever, then take all the baggage of Biden, make it about Trump, make it about the Trumpy Republicans. Look at this is what every race the Democrats are going to win in a swing state and in a swing district this November is going to be because partly because they're going to be able to a, have an attractive candidate of their own and more importantly, even make it about these crazy Republicans. When you have an incumbent president running for re-election, very hard to make it about the crazy opposition party. So from a strictly political point of view, I think it's hard to, Biden was a godsend in a way in 2020. I think he's a burden going forward. Before we get into the uh, rotisserie politics of 2024 and, you know, Phil Murphy and <laughs> Mitchell <laughs> Andrew, et cetera. Polis, uh, you've already set up the Polis yeah, okay. candidacy. Yeah, all, yeah. Let's just, let's just put all that over to the, over to the side for a second. I, 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 the interesting part of the Leavage thing for me was more of the timing element of this. Like it's one thing to say he shouldn't do it again. It's another to say, maybe it actually frees him up a little bit to do now. Uh, just really quick, I'm Mona, I want to come to you. Not only is that what, what Bill just laid out in Pennsylvania is true across the board. I was kind of surprised. I met last week, maybe two weeks ago, with one of the Senate candidates in Wisconsin um, who happened to be in town. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, we were sort of talking and he said to me, and in our internals, but like Evers, the Democratic governor of Wisconsin, is at like 49.50, you know, fav- favorability. Um, when, and Biden's at 38. 
right? So I, it's not it's not just one off because of like various candidates in various states. Like this is true across the board. It, it, it would would it do? I think that there's an argument that it just creates chaos, right, for him to to announce something like that now and doesn't actually help any of these guys or give them any cover. I don't know what's what's your, what's your um, what's your take on on how he can best help the midterms, you know, with you know related to to this stuff, Mona. Well, the midterms, I think it's too late. Uh, I think that's baked right now. But um, but you know, we can think of many examples in recent history where a president two years into his term has been deeply unpopular and then gone on to win resoundingly re-election. You know, we, we saw that with Bill Clinton. We saw it with Ronald Reagan. We saw it with Obama. I mean, you know, it happens over and over again. But the one thing that we know for certain, I mean, we don't know if Biden's approval might improve over the next two years, but we know for sure he's going to be 84. OK, I mean, that's going to happen. He's getting older. He's too old. And it, it, I agree with Bill, he was a godsend for a, a, a moment when we desperately needed him, but he, but he is simply too old. He doesn't have the energy. He doesn't have the uh, resources to, to run for a second term. There is widespread feeling to that effect in the country. I think it's part of why his popularity is where it is. Um, and so um, the best thing that he could do for his party and arguably for his country um, is to th start planning the transition and um, start giving it, start elevating some people within his party that he thinks would be worthy successors. Um, obviously, there are problems with Kamala Harris. Um, <clears throat> he could elevate some people like Mitch Landrieu and others. He could appoint them to pete. you know sorry pete, pete mayor pete may well okay mayor. come on all right let's you know mayor pete was a mayor of a city with you know what three hundred thousand people or something i mean that's all he's ever done so i know he's a good talker i know it's the fun part we're gonna set aside well i'm gonna be jvl <laughs> nobody i wanted i thought one of you guys would be jvl but i'll just pretend to be jvl even though i don't agree with this but Biden's the only one that can hold the coalition together. Like, like there is no, there is no other option. So shouldn't, shouldn't the Democrats not be listening to pundit brained Mark Leibovich and his beltway DC, you know, wise talk and, sh and shouldn't they be listening to Biden who has countered the pundits time and again, when they said that he was dead and, and really like who else, there is nobody else. That can hold together this coalition. So shouldn't the focus be on how can how can you do as much as possible to, to prop him up and maximize you know what he is doing? What would your pushback to that be, Will? Look, Joe, he I'm with Mona. He's too old. First of all, Mona's right. The midterms are baked, and after the midterms, I'm going to get baked. That's all done, right? <laughs> then then it, Joe Biden had one job. <laughs> Joe Biden had one job in 2020 which was to keep Donald Trump, get Donald Trump out of the White House. He did the job. And unfortunately he has one job again, which is to keep Donald Trump out of the White House in 2024. And no other question is as important as whether he can do that, right? Or is there somebody else who can do it better? Um, I, as a card carrying critic of Biden's age, and you can be Biden's age and be lucid. Biden is losing some of that. It's not that Biden can't think. Biden's fine at thinking. He's wise, he's sensible and all that. He's not good at talking. And it's a real problem when the person with the bully pulpit can't talk. And a lot of his problems in the polls are he can't get out there and drive a message. Like you could give Donald Trump the same economy that Joe Biden had and Donald Trump would go out there and sell it. He did, right? And Joe Biden just doesn't do that. So we need somebody who can sell it. And if Joe Biden can't, isn't up to that job. And Tim, I would, I would argue that rather than saying Biden's the only one who can hold it together, it's better to open things up. And I think you would find that if you, if you opened up the field, some people would emerge who are more capable of driving a message and, and I get, re I get really worried. I, JVL Tim, a just on that. I get really worried. We open up, okay, Bill, I'm coming to you. We were open up the field. We get a woke fest. And like it actually, no I mean, way. the 2020 primary was in was insane. They were bad. Was, but, it was, yeah, it was like, no, it was the Judge like, and, 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 and Biden got the bulk of the vote, I would just say. I mean, in fact, not the woke, not the wokesters. Look, we will have empirical data on this in November. Gretchen Whitmer is going to be running for re-election as governor of Michigan. If she wins by seven points, I'm just making this up, but let's say she does, she'll have the advantage of a kooky Trumpy opponent. On the other hand, Trump will be the opponent maybe in 24, and he's pretty kooky. 
how do you say Gretchen Whitmer can't hold the coalition together? She will have just literally gotten more votes in Michigan, a bigger margin in Michigan than Biden in 20. Polis in Colorado. I mean, we'll have a lot of people on the ballot in 22 who either will or won't be able to hold the Democratic coalition. Now it's different for president than for governor. I understand all that. But I think a governor who wins a swing state, a senator who wins a swing state, uh, if Val Demings gets 49% of the vote against Rubio in Florida, it'll be a little more than Biden got. I think, you know, why can't the Polis Demings or Whitmer, you know, whatever ticket that, that, that holds the coalition together? I really don't. I know JVL says this. I mean, JVL is JVL's in the chat and we had an excellent secret podcast today, so I don't want to offend him in any way. But I just don't quite buy the <laughs> argument that there will be a fight. The woke, you'll have a bad few months where there'll be too much woke talk in Democratic debates, which could do a little damage. But that's going to happen anyway, even if Biden runs for re-election in the sense that they'll still be around talking, you know. And I think at the end of the day, your Polis, Demings, Whitmer, whoever ticket is is stronger. Um, OK, I want to do we've got we have four minutes left. So I want to do rapid round. There was another news item about Biden that was a little concerning that I think is a little I, sometimes it's easy to fall back on. He's a bad communicator. And that's the problem. I, are there some substantive issues? My child's yelling. Um, it sounds like there was a uh, they, they had a meeting on the Hill today with, you know, all the top White House people about e- economic stuff and that the House Democrats leaked to kind of Politico that was like, they don't have anything like they're not there. There isn't like, a, hey, you know, they have a reconciliation to use. They could do trade, you know, tariffs like, like there, there isn't any like there isn't any. Not only is there no message, but there's no substance to back up the message. So like rapid fire, everybody has one minute go around. Like, what can they do? I know you all think it's baked, but the margins matter here. Like, what can they do to demonstrate on the economy that they're doing something and the Republicans are the ones who have no actual interest in doing anything besides relitigating 2020. Uh, Will, you go first. Uh, well, I guess top of my list would be something like prescription drugs, something where the government can, it's very hard to influence the economy, but one one place where the government can influence things is by negotiating the price of drugs. And that's, that's where I would move. Mona. Uh, I would um, fire Janet Yellen and replace her with Larry Summers to show you're serious about inflation and cut all of the Trump tariffs which would put about $800 in everybody's pocket uh, per year. William. Totally agree on the tariffs, which would have a pretty quick effect and open up drilling on federal lands much more than they're, they're not doing it at all now, actually. Instead of going to Saudi Arabia and, and, and landing there and giving a pardon in effect to MBS, which incidentally is going to be a much bigger political problem, we can discuss this next week, than they think. I believe this is going to, it's going to hurt the fight again. Putin will look, see that and think, oh, okay, you just hang on for a few months and all the crimes get forgotten, you know? And I think the image of Biden going there, you know, to pay homage to MBS, that's terrible. Pass a damn popular reconciliation bill. It's not that hard. Raise some taxes on some rich people and give people a break on something in exchange for it. Cut the deficit a little bit. Like it's not that hard. Cut it. Uh, that is a three point deal. Um, okay, we, you ended with Saudi Arabia. We have two minutes before the big basketball game. Um, I would like to rant. Like not only is he going to MBS. Have you guys been following the golf tour? Like MBS is MBS is running circles around everybody right now. So he has created this. We're never not my party on this coming up that, that nobody's going to click on, but it's my pet pet issue right now. MBS has created a golf tour, the live golf tour. That is a competitor to the PGA. Yeah. And he's putting so much money in it that Phil Mickelson, Dustin Johnson, Greg Norman, big name people are joining this golf tour in the fall. The, their big events when the PGA goes off are going to be at the Trump hotels here in D- here in dc like this is going to be a very major like wedge cultural issue in addition to a gas prices issue and biden like seems like he's just walking into sucking up to mbs with like uh, is there any guarantee he's going to get anything out of it I-, I just i don't understand what's happening with with biden i i know that they feel like they're in a rock and a hard place but like it- it'd be one thing if i felt like this was real politique and Jake Sullivan was over there and he was coming up with a good deal and we're going to give MBS this, he's going to give us that. It doesn't really seem like that's what's happened. It seems like he's kind of begging. No? Will, 
Well, you're the least neocon ish here. Do you have any yeah, defense? I'm kind of, of fascinated by you neocons. What happened to the sort of like, uh, look, the Soviet, the Russian empire is back, right? We're supposed to go into a polar, bipolar world. We're supposed to be cutting deals with all of the right wing of the authoritarians who can do something to help us against them, like releasing a lot of oil. We're all, we go talk to the Venezuelans, we go talk to the Saudis, whatever. You guys instead are talking all this human rights stuff. You, what, what are you, you're, you're woke. You're woke. You're with me. Mona, <laughs> Mona, 30 seconds. Any thoughts yeah, on that? So we don't want to get oil from bad guys, which means we have to wean ourselves off oil, because guess what? Most of the oil in the world is in the hands of the evil ones. Therefore, nuclear power, that is cheap and available energy that doesn't pollute. And that's where we should be going. And if Biden had some creativity, he would be the, the spokesman for switching to nuclear it would solve many of our problems, yeah. but it doesn't have the We could nuke Phil Mickelson and Greg Norman and, those, <laughs> and their blood money on the way out. All right. Thank you all for being here. Thursday night bulwark. Go enjoy Steph Curry and the beautiful game uh, tonight. Uh, I'm on Charlie's pod tomorrow. So I'll see you there. Everybody else catch you next week. Bye.